What is going on, everybody? Today we are joined by one of the bright draft minds around, Mike Renner. And Mike, the last time I saw you was deep into the night in Mobile, Alabama. Uh, I learned something from you. I learned they have uh, peanut butter chocolate chips that you can put on the waffles. Is that like your normal uh, Waffle House order? Or were you trying something new that night? I usually get the peanut butter waffle. It's tremendous. They pair perfectly together. Um, they didn't have them on the, they didn't have the double waffle though on the menu. That was like a staple. Mm. You just said double waffle probably like two years ago, two or three years ago. And they just knew what a double waffle was. Now they took that off the menu. I was probably mm. the only one ordering them. So Damn. Is that just like a stack? And then they just, it's just two it. waffles, but they call it the yeah. double waffle. <laughs> yeah. They <laughs> brought you waffles. like two plates, two different plates, two waffles. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, cool. Good to see you in the, in the light of day. Uh, today we are going to be embracing mock draft Monday a little bit. We were originally going to just talk some prospects and stuff, but I was like, Hey, it's, it's Monday. I haven't done a mock draft in like three weeks, which is a long time in, uh, in the draft analyst world. So, uh, we're going to go, we're going to go back and forth, uh, of, of what we would do. Uh, first off, you guys can find Mike on Twitter, uh, handle in the, in the description below, but also, uh, the, the Renner ranks podcast and, uh, yeah, definitely check, check out all his work. He does amazing draft content. Um, but I do want to give you the odds, Mike, uh, because I'm curious what you're going to do with the Patriots at three and the Packers, our Packers also our have Packers. pick 25. So I got to get your take on who you'd take there. Uh, you Panthers gave me the Bears fans, too. So I get to screw. I the gave Bears you the Bears. Over. You can screw them over. Uh, <laughs> uh, um, Mike, um, JJ McCarthy, number one overall, maybe exactly for the Bears. Um, and then, uh, yeah, I don't remember if I said this or not, but Panthers fans, you guys will get your pick in this mock draft. Before we do get started, though, um, I feel it would be best to resolve the two big quarterback veteran moves here. Uh, Justin Fields, first of all, uh, first of all, like first off, do you agree the Bears trade him? That seems to be the consensus at this point. I I think it's definitely your drafting quarterback at one. I'm not necessarily sure that means you have to trade them. Now, from what I've heard in terms of like the Bears locker room, how much they love that guy, it probably makes sense to trade them and not have that debate or whatever the internal conflict that could arise by keeping him and drafting quarterback number one overall. But I'm of the opinion that Caleb Williams is not necessarily a guy that has to be thrust in day one, right? I, I think going from the offense he ran at USC to an NFL offense is a big leap for him. It's going to be a lot different. I think there's an argument to be made that he could stand to have kind of a Mahomes year where, you know, Mahomes is coming from a Cliff Kingsbury offense too, to the NFL. And mm -hmm. yeah, maybe he would have been awesome year one too, but I do think there is an argument to be made that kind of taking that pressure off the guy, because there's so much pressure that comes off of being number one overall pick that, if they you don't have that necessarily immediate transition in the NFL, that if you start to falter, and most rookies do, guys can lose confidence, guys can go on a spiral downward that won't necessarily happen. So I think there's an argument made that Fields' draft value could rise if he plays better next year, that Caleb Williams could stand for a year on the bench, and that all things considered, you could get more in return for, for Justin Fields next offseason. But if you really don't think the situation in the locker room is tenable, I do think, yeah, you have to at least uh, you have to trade him at that point. I I do like the the kind of out of the box thinking there. I know you got some hate when you said that, but uh, it's it's honestly it's something to think about. I have my my view on Fields has definitely changed to the point where like I think he's a good starter. I'm kind of done like dreaming of the upside and all that. So it's like it's not necessarily like you're holding on to him to see if he takes some giant leap, but he is probably going to be a better quarterback in year one than Caleb Williams. So it's, it's certainly something to think about. Um, but I'm just going to let you decide because you, you technically have the number one pick. So I'm going to kind of just let you operate as the bears and decide where you want to trade him. Um, for me, I think Atlanta Pittsburgh are probably the two likeliest spots, but uh, I'll, I'll, t I'll leave that to you. I think it's Pittsburgh. I, I think that's where it makes the most sense from, you know, everyone liked Atlanta when Arthur Smith was the head coach, and now Arthur Smith's the OC of the Steelers. And I think that's the fit, is the running first offense with a guy like Justin Fields because of how much a weapon that dynamic just impacts how opposing defenses have to play. So 
Pittsburgh obviously wants to run the ball. They want to be a defensive team. The ethos kind of just makes sense there for God just fields. Whereas now with what the Rams are, or excuse me, with the Rams staff going over to Atlanta, mm -hmm. they're not necessarily, or there's just no track record of them utilizing the rush throughout the quarterback like that. Like they want a guy who can operate. They, they would rather have the Kirk cousins in this off season kind of quarterback sweep six. So if I'm the bears, I'm one. And I am deciding to trade Justin Fields. I'm probably moving into the Steelers. What it's going to take, I don't know, maybe a third or maybe like a conditional sort of pick is, I, is kind of how quarterback mm -hmm. trades go nowadays is what I end up imagining would be probably a third conditional second sort of thing. Um, and then I just go Caleb Williams number one overall. Yeah. Yeah, it's not going to be a first for – I've seen some Bears fans on Twitter doing like – fake trades with fields uh, putting a first round pick in there. I, I just don't think that's uh, that's realistic, especially when you consider that he's got to be paid soon. Exactly. Um, and then what about the Minnesota Vikings? I, I think I'll make the decision on this one. Um, I, I think Kirk's going to be back personally. I agree. Um, I agree. Um, but the one spot would be the Falcons. I really think it's going to come down to those two teams, especially after Pittsburgh is resolved. Uh, I just think that the Falcons are going to have to basically sell their soul for Kirk Cousins to convince him to leave Minnesota as someone that lives in Minneapolis. I was at the game where Kirk ripped his shirt off, was banging the drum. Fans were screaming, screaming for him. Like if he's a guy that is recovering his Achilles and checked out of the team and wants to leave, I don't think that that is something that he works out with the team because that's something he's got to go through the, you know, go through the Vikings to make happen. So um, personally, I think he loves the Vikings. I think the Vikings feel like they can compete in the NFC with them. And even if last year they were tr trying to get kind of one foot out uh, earlier by not renewing his contract, I think this year it's a whole different landscape. And and I think he's, I think he's back. And he was also awesome with them last year, right? I, I mm -hmm. think there's an argument to be made that if he goes somewhere else, you know, at this point in his career, this is like a vastly different era of his life than when he left Washington the first time around, right? Whenever everyone called him like a mercenary going to the highest bidder sort of thing. I think mm -hmm. he's at a different point where he, he just wants a situation that is good for him. And it's hard to argue that Atlanta is a better situation from the Minnesota right now with the two offensive tackles you have in Minnesota with the two wide receivers you have in Minnesota. It's like, he, he's going to go there. He was on, he could have won the MVP if he stayed healthy this past season. Mm -hmm. truthfully. So I, I do think that all that put together, I'd be very surprised if he leaves. Agreed. All right. So those have been settled, which just uh, makes the mock draft easier for us. So we know who doesn't need a quarterback. Um, all right. So you have already made your pick. I'm going to kind of bounce back and forth. I think between sharing our screen here, um, we have not exchanged any first round picks, so we can hop in here. And then with oh, the PFF, first, mock draft, Sam. the Let's PFF, go. you know, a thing or two about this basically built the damn thing. I, uh, um, I fought, I fought to try to keep it free for you guys. I truly did. I could I, I still had the Slack messages, but I think, I think it's a, is it locked now to, to non-subscribers or what's the deal? I haven't, I'm obviously a subscriber. Um, so. That is my understanding. Yeah. So I'm, I'm good to yeah. go with that. Um, all right. So Caleb Williams, number one, we've already discussed him. So that puts me on the clock. Number two. And I know there's a debate here between na uh, uh, not neighbors, uh, Drake May, and I saw the LSU logo on the simulator. It threw me off uh, because PFF has, oh my goodness, how far? They have Jaden Daniels down at 22 on the simulator. So I had to scroll down to find him. Um, I tend to agree that there is that big gap there with Drake May, number three on the simulator. I am going to go with Drake May. Uh, I will say it is fascinating because my pro comp for Daniels is Kyler Murray and uh, Cliff Kingsbury has since um, gone and become the offensive coordinator. He's familiar with a quarterback that doesn't love to attack the middle of the field like a uh, Daniels. So there is a world where Cliff says, I, I actually would prefer Daniels, but uh, Drake may is, is just a much better prospect overall. Uh, I just put out my quarterback rankings video. So you guys can check that out. If you want a uh, deeper analysis on how I feel about Drake, but, I will spin it back to you with number three here. Sorry, I'm, I'm getting used to the, the, sh the screen sharing here. But uh, yeah, I was really curious to see what where you were going to go with the Patriots here. So I agree with the May take. To me, in this quarterback class, like those guys, they didn't play their way down this year, my board at all, in terms of like, obviously their numbers weren't as good as previous year. 
but neither May nor Williams played their way down. Whereas Daniels, it's more Daniels and Nick kind of played their way up, in my opinion, to get mm-hmm. close. But I still see them as like premium, premium prospects in Caleb Williams, Drake May. But at number I do three, have a question. Um, okay. So you you had watched a lot more May coming into the year than I had, I think. Mm-hmm. So I saw a lot of like accuracy issues with May in in year three. Was that something that showed up in year two or or not? He's not he's not pinpoint accurate by any means. That's not mm-hmm. I wouldn't say his biggest strength. Um, but he he can't like his accuracy at the it's probably intermediate level is where I see it the shakiest. I think it's his deep accuracy where um, it's also like he probably took a step back this year compared to the year prior. Um, but that's also something that's like very much can be receiver uh, dependent as well as how those balls mm-hmm. come out. So I'm not too worried about it given all the other stuff he can do. Yeah. All right. Number all right, three. Go ahead. Doing Patriots. I've poured over the Patriots roster cap situation, really thinking about what I would do with them because I think they're the crux of the draft. One and two, I I think they pick themselves at this point. But three, the Patriots objectively have the worst roster in the NFL right now in terms of like forward looking, who would you least want to have? It's the Patriots. They they literally have to re-sign their two best offensive players right now. And they were probably one of the worst offenses in the NFL last year. So if I draft a quarterback, I'm putting them into the worst situation possible. And as we saw last year, when that's the case, chances are Patriots are drafting number one overall in 2025 or close to it again, no matter who I draft. And as much as I think Jaden Daniels, Bo Nix could be franchise quarterbacks, could be worth pick here. There's enough talent in next year's quarterback class that someone's also going to rise to that point as well, right? It just, it usually happens more often than not, even compared to like the Howell Rattler year where no one ended up Mm -hmm. being good. There's more talent, I think, for someone to break through next year in that quarterback class that I'm going to draft Marvin Harris Jr. here. Truly, I'd rather trade down, but I don't think we're doing trades here. And so with that being the case, I'll just take the guy who I know is going to be a building block for me and whoever does end up being my quarterback and realize that it's not going to flip the script here overnight after what Bill Belichick left me with this roster. Yeah, I'm in in the same boat. I just I think you look at all the quarterbacks that have failed. It's in situations like this and everything you described is is so spot on it. uh, I agree about the trade down is definitely in play for me. Just collect a boatload of picks because they need O line. They need receivers. They need tight ends. Hunter Henry is even a free agent, I think. So it's it's pretty crazy. I mm-hmm. I, I like Na- – um, I did it again, neighbors. Um, I like Daniels. Uh, but, man, I don't think he's a quarterback that can, like, transcend situation. I don't think there's many quarterbacks that can. And I, I totally agree as well that, like, someone's going to rise to the crop uh, next year. So we will. We will put uh, Marv off the board, much to the – I, I got to – Get used to clicking the right button here. All right. Um, much to the chagrin of um, of Cardinals fans who I know want themselves some, uh, what do they call them? Maserati Marv. Maserati. Uh, and what do they call them? One person calls them that. <laughs> it's yeah. just Gus Johnson. There's no one else. Gus Johnson. Uh, he, hey, he carries a lot of weight. He carries a lot yeah. of weight. Um, all right. So this this pick is, is very easy for me. It's Malik Neighbors. And I... I, I'm curious on your take on this. I don't have a huge gap between Neighbors and Marv. I think I think uh, Neighbors is incredible. I, um, in terms of like my grading scale, he is the highest graded receiver I've had since I've been doing this. Not named Marvin Harrison. I don't know what this guy can't do. He's he runs wicked good routes. He's got great deep speed. I think he's much better at the catch point than like I think people bring that up as a weakness because they're looking for a weakness on him. And maybe he's not an elite like catch point guy, but he's certainly good enough at it. Um, And then you hear enough people say like, maybe a weakness is contested catches. And then that permeates throughout the echo chamber. And all of a sudden he's not a good contested catch guy. I'm like, I don't know, man. I saw him plenty of times play (laughs) through contact, win at the catch point, make sensational catches his run after the catch ability. That's where like the DJ Moore comp comes in. Cause if nothing else, this guy's going to be able to catch slants screens crossers and be a monster after the catch um he's got the size i i just i really i think he is it would be the best wide receiver in, in pretty much every draft class 
even more than like I have a higher grade on him than like Jamar Chase coming out just because Jamar had uh, sat out the last year. Um, if he played, maybe he'd be over neighbors. But I think those aren't unfamiliar or, or disfamiliar prospects, honestly. I think he's that level of a player. So uh, I don't think this is some consolation prize for for the Cardinals. And I think he would be the better receiver in his rookie year with Kyler Murray than Marv would in, in New England. I think I agree with pretty much all you said there and that there are there are teams where I would rather have neighbors than Harrison. Like they're that close in my eyes where it's like, depending on role, depending on scheme, I could see going neighbors over Harrison. Now that Harrison's, I think just a little safer um, in his projection, but neighbors is kind of where the game's trending. You don't necessarily need the skill set that Harrison has in your offense. Whereas if you have neighbor skill set that every offense can kind of take advantage of that. And that just, it just changes games with what he can do. So yeah, I, I'm with you right there. Cool. I, that leaves right, me. This, this is kind of a tough five. one. Not at all, in my opinion. At this point, with this board, it is Joe Alt Notre Dame offensive tackle for me for the Los Angeles Chargers. Yep. I want you know obviously injuries propped up with Justin Herbert this past year. You've given him a below average offensive line every single year of his career. You have Jim Harbaugh who as your head coach, who's built, you know, in San Francisco through the trenches, that O line, that D line, that's his ethos. And now obviously I'm doing this on my own, but I do think that's still um, how he's going to build this Los Angeles chargers team. And so give him what he needs for that regard. But then also once you draft all and you have a Sean Slayer on the left side, foreseeably the rest of Justin Herbert's career, he should have above average pass protection. You know, you have, you draft Zion Johnson on the interior too. Hopefully he takes, you know, gets, takes a bigger step here in year three, but like mm -hmm. this should be it. Like this should be like that, you know, the basically what you worry about with quarterback in terms of getting hurt, in terms of not having the pass protection, that's all over now. Now, yeah, you're moving them from left tackle to right tackle. There could be a rookie learning curve. There is with all rookie tackles. But Alt's as safe as it gets, man, at the position. He's just that good. Yeah. Well, and both Alt and Slater are such just sensational overall athletes for their position. I would think at least one of them could move to right. Yeah. Um, They're so coordinated. They're just so like yeah. innately. Yeah. yeah coordinated. And I like to think, I like to think that for most people, the whole left side, right side thing is is a bit of an older uh idea that like you have to be a left tackle. Cause I just I think. If you're if you're one of the best tackles and you're on the right side, you're going to get paid like the top left tackles. So yeah. I don't I don't really worry about left side right side there because I like to think one of them would be willing to play right tackle and play at a really high level. So I I love that pick uh, for every reason you said. That puts the Giants up at number six, and this puts me on the spot because um, Daniels is still there uh, at that quarterback spot, and this is another similar ish situation in new England. I think where you're putting them in there. If you take the quarterback here, you're taking them with no wide receivers, very shaky offensive line. I actually like a trade down here for the giants. I, I moved all the way down to 20 in my last mock draft giants fans weren't too happy with that, but I got a future first uh, to maybe attack quarterback next year with that. Um, but again, if this is what I'm doing, I'm still not, taking Daniels I'm not quite high enough on him and this really just comes down to like my grade on him my evaluation on him I'm not quite high enough on him to say he is for sure going to overtake Daniel Jones and be the future here especially when you're taking this incredible asset that could be a tackle or a wide receiver and reinvesting it in the quarterback so if I'm staying put here I'm just going to go best offensive player available although that might be Brock Bowers. I don't think I'm um, taking Brock Power Bowers here. I'm not going to call it a luxury pick, but I, I think I think going with a little bit more of a meat and potatoes type of pick here would, would be best. So you could go Vashanu, I think, is in play. Uh, another left side, right side debate to be had there with Andrew Thomas. Or you could go with Roma Dunze. Um, I think I will go Rome here. I just that's a type of wide receiver that they just don't have right now. They have a bunch of slot guys. Uh, they have a, a tight end that they're hoping they can stay healthy. 
Um, I love that they brought in Carmen Brasillo, the offensive line coach from the Raiders. So hopefully he can uh, figure out the right side of the offensive line there. But I, I think you you need to you need to get some real playmakers on the outside. Give give someone Daniel Jones can have some confidence in pushing the ball downfield because he has turned into such a ridiculously conservative player. Uh, if you've got a guy in third down, you can trust on the outside like Roma Dunze with with his incredible back shoulder and contested catch ability. Uh, maybe you can start uh, launching the ball a little bit more than 10 yards on, on third down. It's like what they wanted Kenny Galladay to be. You can about like, yeah, I, exactly. I like, I, I like that pick. I, I mean, I think the giants are in a good spot in like real life that to get, they're going to get a top tackler, or top wide receiver. And I, I do think there could be an argument to be made for them to go quarterback because while the situation is not good now, you're not also starting that guy right now. I don't think, mm -hmm. um, but also if you're Joe Shane, the GM there, it's like his talks, his clock's kind of ticking in terms of like all the yeah. decisions he's made where that roster has been going is not in a positive direction. So he needs to win as well. All right. That and made Daniels my is, is what? 24 years old. Yeah. I think so it's be... like, if you're taking a draft and develop guy, he's not playing until he's 25. That's, that's pretty crazy. Quarterback though. It's like, I don't know how that even yeah. development even works. It's just a different animal altogether. Um, it is. Yeah. All right, that made my life easy at number seven with Tennessee Titans because I would have liked, you know, any of the wide receivers, any of those top three had they fallen for Will Levis. But at this point, there's no there's no one that's going to convince me. And Brock Bowers, as much as, you know, I like him as a tight end prospect, I don't think he moves the needle necessarily nearly as much as Olufashana would because I need – a better left tackle than Andre Dillard, than Nicholas Petit Freire. I just, I need it for that guy. The guy was under, yeah. uh, Levis was, had just fighting to keep his head above water half his games last year. So that's, that one's with the board, way the board's fallen. There's no debate in my eyes. Take the best pass protecting tackle. Yeah. That's I think, I think that's easy. All right. Atlanta up at number eight. Obviously, Brock Bowers, they need more, uh, Unique playmakers. Yeah. Um, if Arthur That'd Smith is the... there, they might. <laughs> they just put him might. at running back. Yeah, seriously. Um, so I always go to edge here, but in this world, they don't have a quarterback yet. And Jaden Daniels is there. Um, I love Jaden Daniels in that offense with all those playmakers. Um, so yeah, if he falls to eight, I think this is this is a good spot for him. I, I think they still would considered signing a veteran as well but uh if, if that guy's not Kirk cousins i think they might start thinking about the rookie class a lot more too so we're gonna go Jaden daniels i can dig it and that's they're they're gonna be involved in this quarterback back class right one way or the other i think i i don't mm -hmm. think they end up getting one of the veterans of free agency it just it feels like if you hit on a quarterback if the atlanta falcons here with you know, what they've just drafted in terms of Drake London, Cal Pitts, B. John Robinson. If you hit that quarterback, you have a – the window just opens massively for this team because you're so cheap. You, you so you have so many avenues where you can just add via free agency because you won't be paying your best players a ton of money. And, yeah, I, I do think that that's the route I would attack if I were them as the draft. All right. Number nine. Da Bears. Bears back on the clock. I, I do – think there's an interesting conversation to be had about Brock Bowers here in Chicago. If you really are willing to be creative. So now Shane Waldron, OC, coming over from Seattle, has proven that he's willing to think outside the box, does some different stuff. I think a lot of teams running two tight ends, and especially with Bowers and Komet being just like two different types of tight ends, right, that they can be used complementary, and that Bowers can almost just be a slot receiver in your offense who can also block at a high level. And if you want to get Caleb Williams involved in the running game, which, you know, do you want to subject him that year one? It's, it's a whole nother debate. But if you do, and it's obviously a big way to maximize the guy's strengths, he's so athletic. Bowers is a great option in terms of what he can do on the move as a run blocker. You could have a dominant rushing offense there in Chicago if you added him to the mix and just the flexibility a guy like that gives you. But so like if I were kind of building the team, I think I would lean Bowers for them. But I'm not sure I can like bank on the Bears brass having the same sort of vision that I do. Yeah. So at that point, I think I'm going to go Byron Murphy, the Texas DT here. 
because wow. I think he's that good of a prospect. The more I watch yeah. this guy down the stretch, the more I just see, you know, I see Geno Atkins. I see one of those undersized DTs that's just going to be a nightmare for opposing offenses for a decade. Um, I, I feel better about him than any of the edge guys really reaching that kind of upper echelon of their respective position. Um, but I don't think nine's too high. I, I think he truly is a every down impact player that can play anywhere from nose to three tech and be effective. So yeah, I, I'm a big fan of his game and think this is, you know, he's not getting mocked here necessarily by a lot of people, but I think that's how talented he is in my eyes. Awesome. I, I love to hear it. I actually haven't gotten to Byron Murphy yet. That's like next on my watch list, I think is to do him in sweat. Uh, so very much looking forward to that. I mean, yeah, if the board falls this way and the top three wide receivers are gone, I think D-line is is very much in play for them. Um, you can always attack wide receiver later in the draft. So uh, exciting pick there. Uh, for the Jets, I just go straight to offensive line here every time. Um, obviously a little bit more difficult with Alt and Fashanu off the board here. I like Fuaga. But is he going to be a safe pass protecting tackle for you in year one? I think there's some risk there. I don't think any of these guys really are that guy, honestly. So it's it's a little uh, tougher to pull the trigger there. I'm, I'm it's a little early to take. Hmm, it's a little early to take interior too. I'm looking at Brock Powers right there, honestly. Um, it's it's either him or Fuaga, but I I do think Brock Powers is a really special player. They don't really have a lot of juice uh, in that wide receiver room. I think Brock Bowers can basically be a way better version of what they thought they were signing in Alan Lazard as a big slot, a blocker. You can do so much more with him too. I think I'm gonna I'm gonna take the playmaker here. Hope that some of these guys can stay healthy and and. Uh, yeah, probably use free agency to to look at the offensive line a little bit more there. I would have done the exact same, truthfully. I, I do think that our like the, the, again, you're playing for two the next two years. If a guy's you know you're taking a and even the tackles after the top two, I, I don't feel great about year one how they're going to fare in pass protection. Right, like, I, I'm not sure they're necessarily upgrades over just playing Elijah Vera Tucker at tackle for them. So right, um, but Bowers is for sure an upgrade over their number two wide receiver or number or starting tight ends that they have in tow. So yeah, I, I lean that as the same way that you did just because it's basically what you have to do right now. If you're the New York. Yeah. Guy. Um, before you make your pick, uh, because I'm a, I'm truly a professional here. I told you we were, before we did this, I told you we were going to have three wild cards that we had to play throughout this mock draft. Mm -hmm. um, so I forgot to set that up. Let's just keep it to okay. one. This is an idea that I came up with to try and spice up um, these mock drafts a little bit. Let's just keep this to one of those wild cards that we have to play with one of our picks in it being a big reach. So each of us with any of the remaining picks that we're making here have to take a player that we have a day to grade on just to try to simulate some of that draft randomness that we we tend to see. Uh, in April, so I, I like will, the I, I like the non. Let's, let's throw a non need pick in there too. Let's do. Let's, okay, sounds we can good. We do both. Right, so those are good. Two two wild cards that we got to okay. So we have to do a day two and a non need pick. Yep, I like it. All right, I'm on the clock here with Minnesota Vikings, number eleven. Um, no corner has been taken, and I think that's where I'm looking now. Obviously, I said we got Kirk Cousins back. I think his timeline right now is such that even if I love this quarterback class, you're in a position where the guy could be his entire rookie season on the bench. So I don't think I'm going to go quarterback to go, you know, forward thinking like, you know, the Packers do in your division and get a guy three years down the line. I think it might just be a little bit longer than that, that Kirk Cousins is still playing. So mm -hmm. I'm going to look defense to me. I'm going to go Dallas Turner here. I, I, I know that I, like the top of this cornerback class, guys like Terry on Arnold, Nate Wiggins, I think would be great fits for them. I just think the value of a top tier pass rusher and a guy like Dallas Turner, who in a lot of years is a top 10 pick falls yeah. outside the top 10 here. Cause it's just, there's so many other talented players at other town at other valuable positions, but I think he has high end potential to be, you know, basically what you had, uh, 
in Daniel Hunter for the last, mm -hmm. you know, almost decade. So that's, that's where my head's at. Yeah. And I love trying to get Daniel back and pairing him because what a great like mentor to be like, I came mm -hmm. in as the same guy you were and, and look where I'm at now. So love that for him. All right. Denver Broncos at 12. They, they need a quarterback, man. They do. I'm going to, I'm going to put uh bone Nicks here. I just, I made this my last mock draft. At some point, Broncos fans, I will I will mix this up and give you something other than Bo Nix, but that time is not today. Uh, Bo Nix it is for you. I, I really think you will learn to appreciate Bo Nix for what he is, uh, as as I have, as I've evaluated him. I just I, I think for, for Sean Payton's offense, he is going from Russell Wilson, who the reason that that really flamed out, other than maybe some behind-the-scenes ego stuff, uh, was that Russ would have a wide open slant or a wide open dig and just not see it and not throw it. That's not going to be Bo, Bo Nix. He is one of the the just sharpest, most consistent guys at executing on structure when it's available to him. And then he can sprinkle some stuff in with his feet on top of him. So I really think I, I think um, Peyton's going to watch Bo Nix's tape and be like, that can be my dude now. Uh, and 12 is not. You know, even if you see Bo Nix as a guy that should go with the 20th pick and you're seeing him as more of like a Kenny Pickett type, I think he's a little better than Kenny Pickett was personally. Um, but going, you know, picking him at 12 is not that different than picking him at 20. So uh, maybe you think about a trade down, but we'll, we'll just we'll lock up that QB right here. And I know uh, you're a fan of this one. I've yeah, <laughs> I've said this, mentioned this fit like a zillion times at this point. I, I just I think it makes too much sense in this class. Yeah. All right. Raiders 13. I. I I know they have massive needs along the offensive line, but yeah. I just look at this defensive side of the ball and how depleted they are on their back seven. And I'm going to go Terry on Arnold here at the Alabama corner. Okay. Obviously, yeah, defensive minded head coach, Antonio Pierce. He plays the game in a way that, you know, hard nosed football player, great tackler, going to come up, play the run. He can play nickel for you. He can play outside for you. You know, in that defense, obviously, you have Nate Hobbs. So he's probably playing outside, but I don't think there's much of a difference in his effectiveness between the two positions. So, yeah, I, I think it's just this guy's a darn good corner and impacts this roster more quickly than, say, Italia Sefuaga would. All right, I like it. Um, all right, New Orleans Saints. They are they are like the hardest freaking team to draft for because they're in just such a weird spot. Um, I'm really just thinking best player available for them. I think it's Fuaga for me with him sitting here, at least in, in a relative need for them. He, the, the experiment at left tackle with, uh, why can't I think of Northern Iowa's name right now? Penning. Oh, it's yeah. been a disaster. He, he wasn't even able, able to see the field when he was healthy last year. Um, they were playing like Hurst at guard. And then now there's like some weird stuff popping up with Ryan Ramchek and, and what he's going to be. Although, I do feel like Ramchick's going to be back and he's a right tackle. And I think Fuag is a right tackle. So I don't, I don't know. And, and didn't Ramchick, maybe you don't know this. Didn't Ramchick say, I, I don't want to switch to the left. Uh, I don't know. The, sure. I haven't, I haven't seen. I, I think that was part of the drama there. I would so, imagine though. He wouldn't want to, I would, that'd be crazy at this yeah. point to make, <laughs> to ask him to. Yeah. So actually I'm talking myself out of that pick for that reason. Um, are there, are there other offensive tackles I'm thinking about here? They're all right tackles Mims. at this point. Yeah, they're all right tackles. Latham and Mims maybe could make that swap, but I don't really want to bank on that. So I will actually stay away from that uh, after going down that route. I think it's D-line then at this point. Um, I just, I'm not, I, I hate to do this to a, a Golden Domer, but I, I couldn't believe they took uh, second round last year. Um, Quidipe? No. Oh, no, sorry. No, no. Uh uh, the Notre Dame guy from last year. What I know exactly who. It, we're struggling to think of his hey. name because he really um, wasn't. I say Fosky. Yeah, Fosky. Fosky. Yeah, I, I just I man, I did him. not see like starter, a, a starter there, and I I think Jared Verse. No, I agree. Is the pick here? You just don't really have edge guys. I think he fits what they look for with a just kind of a. So, not a sawed off shotgun in, in terms of arm length, but just that kind of thumping approach. A lot of power. I think you finally get an impact edge rusher that can, that can get after the quarterback there. So uh, a long talking process there, but I think we arrived at the right pick. Yes. Uh, I, I'm 
with you on that, that I don't, I, I don't think that Isaiah Foskey is necessarily the answer. Even, and Peyton Turner can't stay healthy and Cam Jordan's. Yeah. They've had some weird day two picks. Uh, but yeah. he definitely feels like, I mean, obviously we're doing this on our own, but if they're in this edge class, just what they've preferred, whether it's Marcus Davenport, mm -hmm. whether it is Foskey, whether it is Peyton Turner, they would lean Jared verse in this edge class versus all the other guys. I agree. Um, all right. Colts on the clock at 15. I would love to add uh, why I was, why I said Cody Page just off the top of my head, because I was thinking the Colts edge position mm. and wanted to add there. But the pick that I'm going to make here is a little off. It's a little, it's unique. I'm going to go okay. Jackson Powers Johnson here. Ooh, what, what's your okay. superpower if you're the Indianapolis Colts with Anthony Richardson? It's that this run game should be an absolute monster, right? The mm -hmm. guy like Anthony Richardson, where you draft him, where you did, is not because he's an accurate passer of the football and can lead, you know, an offense as a passer like Patrick Mahomes. It's because he is an absolute horse to bring down. And if you get a center in Jackson Powers Johnson, and now I know you have Ryan Kelly there. So maybe you I was just checking that. He's a free agent after next year and will be 32. So yeah, so he's you can play him at guard and then and he's been banged up as well. So you can play yep. probably Jax Powers Johnson at guard, but immediately your push push game is off the charts with a guy like Jackson Powers mm. Johnson. And yeah. then you're just like you have that level of dominance on your front five in the running game, going in the center with Quentin Nelson, Ryan Kelly, Jackson Powers Johnson. That's a lot of beef up front that you could just lean on teams with Jonathan Taylor and Anthony Richardson. That to me is the quickest path to, you know, truthfully, even a Super Bowl there in Indianapolis. So getting that front five as dominant as possible. And I think Jax Power Johnson has like top of the center position, top of the guard position, whatever you want to, sort of traits. Like he could be as good as it gets at that. You could be Quentin Nelson, right? Like in time. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, that's why I lean Jackson Powers Johnson in that uh, for them at least. Yeah, no, you sold me. I I think so that's that, a I think that might be one. the not need, my not need pick, not necessarily a need, right? Um, I'm not gonna let you get away with that okay. because I think their right guard right spot guard is a need. Yeah, yeah, fair. Um, yeah, I'm not gonna let you off easy. <laughs> um, <laughs> all right, Seattle Seahawks. Uh, I do think the interior of that offensive line is quietly. A disaster um unfortunately you just took the best interior offensive lineman snipe you. you know what i one of the cards i thought about doing but i thought it would be too hard to uh do on the fly was a college connection draft pick so i'm just gonna sneak that in um if you want to find one later you can but uh troy fatanu um maybe a little bit earlier but I really see him as a guy that can play tackle or guard. I do have some questions, honestly, about both those tackles. I think Charles Cross will come along. Um, but Abraham Lucas at right tackle had a lot of injuries, was not as good last year. I don't know that he's a, a lock heading into year three. But Fatanu, I think, coming from the same system here in Washington, they just hired uh, – I wasn't the head coach from Washington, right? It was like the offensive coordinator that they, they brought in. Um, but obviously a lot of familiarity there, um, I think – someone that can vouch for Fatanu and gives them just the offensive line flexibility that they need. I'm not as high as Fatanu as most that this would have been, if I would draft yeah. Fatanu here, this would have been my second rounder into the first. Generally. Okay. That's fair. So. That's fair. But I, I do think if you're Seattle, that O line was so bad last year. Now a lot of it was injuries, but also it's just like, you might as well just have some insurance there. Right? You're, yes. You don't have a ton of needs on this roster. Truthfully. Uh, mm -hmm. So getting some insurance there because you can you could have a high end offense if you had pass protection last year with those wide receivers. So, mm -hmm. all right, I'm on the board. 17 Jacksonville Jaguars. Man, I pulled up the wide receiver board for you. <laughs> I do, I do love the idea of wide receiver here. I'm not sure I have any of these guys as like necessarily of value at this point. The one position mm -hmm. I kind of want to go. And I know they just drafted it last year, and I know they have like talent there, but so this O line is still rough. And one of these tackles, I could draft, play at guard, have them kind of be an heir apparent, or just like just add some talent to this offensive line because these guys at this point are like too good of prospects for me to just like 
to pass on. If I'm, it's almost gotten to the point where these tackles are at number 17, they just come, don't come around every year. So I'm going to go, I'm going to go Taliesa Fuaga here. Just okay. as this is a non need. That one's definitely a non need pick. Cause yeah. I mean, you got Walker little, you have Cam Robinson, you have Anton Harrison. I just want this offensive line to perform better though. And so just yeah. adding more talent to it, figuring that out later where they all slot in is something that I think I'd be a fan of if I was a Jaguars fan, just because you just need more talent up front than you had a year ago. Yeah, I like it. Um, all right. I think I'm going to use my non-need pick here as well on the guy at the top of the board here, Cooper DeGene. Um, the Bengals secondary is solid to good. They have a lot of young pieces. They're going to let Awuzie go. They still have Mike Hilton in the slot heading into his last year of his deal. I thought um, uh, Battle stepped in and played well at safety to be determined if he is the long-term uh, answer there. So I think this is a non-need pick, a guy that can be a, a dime back immediately. But the second someone goes down, you can literally say, Cooper, you're in, whether that's free safety, strong safety, slot, outside corner. Um, and then at some point, he's going to emerge as a full-time starter, whether that's in year one or or later down the board. That's I, I don't hate it, honestly. I mean, it could be – the Bengals have not really drafted needs either in recent years, whether it was yeah. – um, last year with the Clemson D end, whose name's escaping me for some reason. Murphy. Right. Yeah. Uh, Miles Murphy shot. Let me see if I remember. Yeah. Whether it's the year prior when they drafted Dax Hill before, he, you know, he even needed to start. So it's, mm -hmm. he could even honestly play probably more of a role, Cooper DeGene, than either of those two guys did as a rookie, too. So uh, I, I do think offense, though, for this Bengals team is final. It's like the year to go back to the well, in my opinion. Yeah. Um, but we shall see. 19 Rams. This one is easy to me at this point. I am going Laiatu Latu, the UCLA defensive end. Um, yeah, you just they, they like football players, right? They they're not necessarily the <laughs> traits driven organization at this point. Yeah. They are the football player driven organization, and he's the yeah, these are the best football playing defensive lineman. Now, is he the most physically gifted? Is he going to reach the highest ceiling? TBD. I, you know, you're getting a darn good player who can move around and rush the passer from everywhere on that defensive line. So edge group, obviously probably lacking there outside, you know, Byron Young had an encouraging rookie year, but he was also 25 as a rookie. So is there more to be yeah. had there from him? TBD, but Latu is just a guy who year one, that's an upgrade for your edge group. Yeah. I, I like that point that they, they really have not been the traits based organization. They like the undersized guys, the guys with injury questions, all that. So that. Definitely aligns with their line of thinking and definitely aligns with their needs because I, I like Byron Murphy, like you said, but I don't think you can count on him as your best edge rusher. Um, all right, Pittsburgh Steelers are up. Um, they, they got Justin Fields. I honestly, I think the offense is in pretty good shape, especially with all of the old linemen that have, have come off the board at this point. Um, yeah, because I would think about Jackson Powers Johnson if, you're, if he was here, um, but I don't think I'm taking any of the other interior guys. I, th I think I'm going to go – I'm between Jerzon Newton and one of the cornerbacks, but I think I'll go corner for them. I love Joey Porter, uh, but Patrick Peterson is is 500 years old at this point. Uh, they have a motley crew of other dudes back there, but I'm going to take I – I think Mike Tomlin's going to like Quinion Mitchell, always involved at the Senior Bowl, balled out down there. Um, they they like a D back that can can wear every hat, play physical. I I I think Mitchell screams Pittsburgh Steeler to me. I would tend to agree. It just feels like, I mean, feel and he feels perfect opposite Joey Porter Jr. too. Like they're just physical corners that could beat you up. Yep. All right, twenty one Miami Dolphins. I was thinking, I'm debating in my head. I would just like Brian Thomas Jr would just be fun here, right? Like, that would just be an insane <laughs> oh, pick to boy. add to Jalen Waddell, Tyreek Hill. But you still are kind of hampered by two, right? It's still like... How much two, help does he need, stage. Mike? Exactly. Like, he's the limited <laughs> receiver. He's just like, he can't create any more offense at some point. So, I, I still am looking offense, though. I'm still looking at this tackle class. For kind of similar reasons I talked about Jaguars here. It's just like, you got your whole interior is now uh, up for free agency. 
they're in a bad cap situation where they're not going to be able to resign all those guys. I'm going to go Amiris Mims here, the okay. Georgia tackle who hasn't played a ton of football. So you can kind of groom him to wherever you want. And with where Teron Armstead is at in his career, I think, I think you just groom that guy to be your left tackle of the future mm-hmm. and, you know, protect to his front side, not his blind side, his front side here. Yeah, for sure. Um, I like the development projection for him there and he's going to play at some point because yep. Armstead's going to miss five exactly. or six games. Like you have to treat that as a need for a, a third of the year, at least. Um, all right. So I haven't used, I guess I did use my non need pick. I should, I need to start thinking about where I'm going to use my reach. I don't think that's going to be the Eagles. They tend to just kind of go best player. Um, gotta be corner, right? I mean, Nate Wiggins, I think is fantastic. I haven't really brought him up yet. I, I certainly thought about him with Pittsburgh. Uh, I just thought Mitchell uh, plays a little bit more physical and, and fit the profile there, but uh, Nate Wiggins definitely to, to Philadelphia is, is pretty self-explanatory. I don't think they would pass up a guy that can move like that with that size at such a need for, for their team. I tend to agree that they're, if the cornerbacks start to drift on boards, like obviously Wiggins did that Eagles will probably go that route. It's just, and they might move up for one, honestly, like if, if there's a run two mid thirties corners is recipe for early Mm -hmm. thirties, who already showed their declining last year. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. All right. Houston Texans on the clock. This one, uh, just based on the board, it looks pretty easy to me. It's Johnny Newton, the Illinois DT. He's, yeah. you have Sheldon Rank. I mean, he's basically just like what Sheldon Rankins did last year, fill that role. Similar type of players, much younger. Um, I think he's probably uh, a little better prospect than even Rankins was coming out in that he's, you know, proven it at, in the Big Ten, multiple seasons of it, uh, I guys can come off the field, and he he's kind of like the Latu Latu of this DT class, and he's just mm-hmm. like man, he's so technically sound that I just think he has a really high floor. And I love him in that in that system with D'Amico. I I feel like he would be uh, such a good DT there. So that's a great pick. All right, Dallas Cowboys. Look, we have had no wide receivers come off the board. I'm going to go with my slight reach pick here, but I think it makes sense. Xavier Worthy, staying home. Brandon Cook's replacement long-term um, can play from the slot. Gives you some speed there that they they really need, some speed that they were looking for with Brandon Cook. So this, I, I do think it's partially a need just because I think Playmaker wasn't quite where they wanted it last year. And, and yeah, but this is going to be my slight reach pick here um, just because of the hometown connections there. Obviously, Brian Thomas would be, a really fun pick there as well, but um, we're, we're just going to have a little surprise pick. We're going to imagine Xavier Worthy comes out and runs like a four two seven and uh, becomes wide receiver four in this situation. I think he's, I think he's a darn good prospect, man. I think he's gotten mm-hmm. underrated in this sort of, and maybe the combine will change that. But to me, he's not too, he's maybe not as pure electric as like a, say a say flowers, but I think he can fill that same role and honestly has maybe like a bigger catch radius and can do some little different things, but he's that guy that can just, you move him around and the speed, all of a sudden the dynamism just like becomes a weapon. So I'm a fan. I'm a fan of them. Uh, 24 is not like super early for me. That's not crazy to me to take him at number mm-hmm. 24 overall either. That all Texas right. offense was frustrating because you knew they had all these great playmakers. You want to see them get Mitchell more, on the outside, you want to see where they used more and even the tight end. Um, and then it felt like half their passes were just dump downs and screens and crossing routes. Like you have all these amazing weapons and they, I felt like they didn't really tap into them. And Quinn Ewers, by the way, need to see a lot more from him too. <laughs> yeah. I think he was a big part of that. The more people didn't necessarily want to talk about because he was so yeah. hyped, but he was not that great last year, truthfully. So, right. All right. Green Bay Packers. I'm going to use my slight reach here as well what brian gutekunst slight reach in the first round (laughs) and we're going down i can't even find him here on this pf it's it's only fitting we ended the cowboys season we made them miserable we just made them more miserable by giving them the slight reach card it's only it's only fair that the packers also use the slight reach card now he may be on the board for them in the second round too but I just want to talk about him because I think this would be a great guy. I mean, it's probably more realistic if they draft him there. But Tavondre Sweat, Texas DT. 
mm. I think is what that D line would just like push it to another level, in my opinion, in terms of one Kenny Clark. I think you have to take off of the nose at this point in his career mm-hmm. and let him be more of a playmaker. He was not the impact guy last year, down to down, week to week that he was in years prior. And it's just a nose tackle just gets beat up, right? It's fact of life that those guys take way more punishment with the double teams. So put a guy there that's like a true nose tackle in this new defense that just, you know, can eat those blocks up and just let Kenny Clark be more of a playmaker. And then you can do mm-hmm. a three down with Clark, Wyatt, uh, and Sweat on early downs with then, you know, Rashawn Gary walked out or uh, even Luke Van Ness walked out. And then you're going to stop the run at a much higher level, in my opinion, with that front than you did with Kenny Clark at the nose, Devontae Wyatt, three tech. I, I I think there's an argument to be made that that would go a long way towards just what's ailing this defense. So, yeah, I'll go to Vander Sweat. Yeah, it definitely seems like a Packers pick. Um, yeah, Slayton's okay at nose, but Sweat could be outstanding at nose. Impact, so, I, yeah. I think that's a lot of fun. Um, cool. All right. Bucks are up. Are there any edge guys left? I think we took them all, right? Yeah. Those those are the three guys I'm the comfortable three, in yeah. the first round. I, I You're a chop guy, right? Didn't you just um, – I am going to probably pick shop here at some point, but yeah. Okay, cool. Um, honestly, you kind of have your pick of the litter at wide receiver. It's something to think about. Keon Coleman, maybe as a Mike Evans replacement long-term Brian Thomas, give you a little bit more vertical speed for Baker. It's, uh, it's tempting. A lot of defensive guys have come off the board, not taking a linebacker here. Although, looking at J.J. McCarthy there, maybe. Give him a couple-year development window. This is kind of the range I'm thinking about, J.J., is Mm -hmm. in like the 25 to 50 range. With the way the board has fallen, I would love to get an edge rusher like I described, but I think if J.J. is there, I think there's a great spot for him, uh, honestly. Just you bring Baker back two, three years and give him the kind of Jordan Love uh, development path. He's so young. I think he needs it. So, uh, yeah, eat, eat our vegetables there a little bit with a long term investment at quarterback. I agree. This is where, to me, the start of where it would make sense to draft someone like JJ McCarthy. You know, maybe yeah. the highest I could see a team really going to bat for him is 21 with the uh, Dolphins. Ahead of that, mm-hmm. it's just too rich for me uh, for what he put on tape, truthfully. So, yep. All right, Arizona Cardinals back on the clock. I have some interesting fits here. At number four, we went Malik Neighbors. I'm going to go – I'm going back to the well here. I'm going Ooh. Keon Coleman for the Arizona Ooh. Cardinals. We are going to okay. give Kyler Murray everything. How are you going to do Michael Wilson like that, Mike? I get – I'm more doing Rondell Moore like that. I just don't think Rondell Moore is part of your 3D. Okay. But then you have Neighbors, Keon Ooh. Coleman – and Michael Wilson probably from the slot. That's like a, that's kind of, that's kind of nasty. You know, it's a nasty, nasty wide receiving core that mm-hmm. you figure out real quick if Kyler's the guy. And obviously, the growing pains are going to be with two rookie wide receivers. We saw that with the Packers this past year. But it's you're you're obviously not you're not turning things around to a championship overnight. This gives you the foundation mm-hmm. for what could be a championship in the next few years. I, I think that's exciting. And um, I have heard some Devondre, uh, uh, DeAndre Hopkins parallels, not necessarily comps, but comparing the mm-hmm. skill set to Keon Coleman. Obviously, Kyler loved to have that guy. I, I like that a it's lot. A distinctly a different from neighbors, too, right? Like in terms of how yeah. you would use both. Yep. Okay. Buffalo Bills are up. Oh, this one's so easy. This, this is the easiest pick I've had. Brian Thomas Jr., uh, just, man, great mm-hmm. deep threat. He is somewhere between Marquez Valdez Scantling and um, a healthy Christian Watson when he wants to play football. Uh, uh, like he's he's the exact player that the the Bills need. So this one's a, a very quick pick. All right, that made twenty nine. Ooh, actually, there's a little bit of a. I, I'm intrigued by the thought of J.C. Latham here. Now he'd mm-hmm. be guard for the Lions, right? But for the same things I outlined with the 
Indianapolis Colts. It's like the, the right side that's J.C. Latham and Penny Sewell is horrifying for and a guy named Frank Ragnall right next to those guys. Yeah, and now Ragnall's absolutely <laughs> beat up every year. But I'm going to go J.C. Latham here just because when you when you rely on that, when you rely on this running game the way the Lions do, you want it to be unstoppable. And mm-hmm. it, Kool-Aid McKintry was the other thought for me there. I, I think he yeah. fits Aaron Glenn's defense perfectly. They have the need a corner. It's but man, Latham could do damage on that offensive line. Yeah, you think very similar to me with some of these picks, like with the Colts and the Lions here. I remember giving Iki Aquanu to the Lions in that draft class. And some Lions fans were like, yes, love it. Run the ball, like destroy people. And some people are like, no, we need skill <laughs> positions. Um, but man, as a Packers fan, that comes off the board. And I'm like, gosh, I thought I thought we were gonna be able to stop this. You run yeah, game. That's, just, that, that's that's like the perfect the, counter punch to the sweat pick. It's like, okay, you want sweat? Take this. <laughs> that is that is like there's something to be said for that. That immediately demoralizes. You know, like the defensive line across the division are like, damn. You know, like they they are yeah. not happy when that guy if that guy comes off the board there. Yep, that's always a good sign of a good pick. Um, all right, Baltimore Ravens at thirty. I know Ravens fans are thirsty for uh, for a wide receiver. I understand. Um, I do think corner is very quietly a massive need for them. And I, I mean, they've they've got some experience taking Alabama corners. I think Kool Aid could certainly be a fit there. You know, Marlon Humphrey at this point, you got to raise questions about his durability. I think uh, Stevens was was fine. They were rolling through like the Ronald Darby's of the world. So I do think that's an underrated need. I think offensive line is a, is a huge need and wide receiver is a huge need. So the, the Ravens quietly have some big spots to fill for a team that was so good last year. They've shown that they want that like developmental tackle uh, when they tried with uh, not my but but uh, the, the big guy from Minnesota a couple of years ago. Oh, yeah. Wow. Falele, yeah, but that yeah. that really hasn't worked out. Tyler Guyton there does scare me, and I think I think this is a situation. It's not necessarily a need pick, but it is like a long term need pick because Moses is not going to be there forever. And Ronnie Stanley, by the way, was not good this year uh, at all. Injury questions. I think I'm going to go Tyler Guyton. I know Ravens fans will want the need pick, but guys with these tools just don't don't come around very often so um we're gonna we're gonna take him off the board there okay yeah i i ravens also it feels like they that's kind of how they do business they would draft a backup like a developmental tackle with kind of how their tackle situation is with stanley's injuries and then most is just age mm-hmm. now, i i got a debate on my hands here with the 49ers because i think kool-aid's a great fit for them schematically mm-hmm. um but I also think that pairing Chop Robinson with Chris Kosarik, their D-line coach, is could be the payoff could be massive with mm-hmm. Chop's trade. So I'm gonna go Chop Robinson. I think he yeah. is a special athlete for the edge, right? Like he moves how Von Miller moves, how and yeah, now I was gonna say Mike Parsons, but no one moves like Mike Parsons. That guy's insane. Um, but you know, he's like in that echelon of athletes that just Man, if he figures it out, this could be a true game changer. So, yeah, I'm going to go chop just because it's, it's a wild card. It's a lottery ticket. The guy could pay off. And, yeah. and you lose, could lose Chase Young, Randy Gregory. Like everyone there is free agents along the defensive line. Yep. Um, okay. Chiefs at 32. So, this is a team that I think free agency is going to tell us a lot because Chris Jones and Legarius Sneed are free agents. Um, but I, I, you're not taking a D lineman here, I don't think. I I think you go wide receiver, and I'm between two very different players here. Lad McConkey, who I love, I finally finished his eval. I'm totally cool with him in the first round, man. He's I think he's going to finish my wide receiver five, uh, and I'm tempted to put him over Brian Thomas for wide receiver four. Like he just, I don't see this guy failing outside of injuries, so I. I think the Chiefs would actually prefer that type of wide receiver. It hasn't worked out with Sky Moore and Kadarius Tony. They're still looking for that dude. Uh, but a Donnie Mitchell is a skill set that I think they could really develop. And 
they just haven't used the perimeter wide receivers because they haven't really had one. It's not like they didn't do that when they had Sammy Watkins and Tyreek Hill. So I, I think Mitchell going to Kansas City is is the more like high upside pick. And uh, yeah, he's he's a special mover for his size, like his route running. I think he's going to be a better run after catch player in the NFL, too, just because I don't think Texas set him up well for run after catch. But you could see like he would catch a hitch and like have that shake after the catch. Uh, he's like a slower CD lamb is kind of what what he reminds me of. So I, Ooh, I, yeah, I, like, that. I like that. They're just movement yeah. wise. I, I do agree mm-hmm. with that. Uh, yeah, they, they have to. I think they're in a good spot to get a wide receiver man in this class too. Yeah, I just think that yep. there will be talent there available for them. That gives me the Panthers at thirty three, and I'm glad you didn't take them because Lad McConkey to me, yes, is what they need. They they have Absolutely. to get a reliable guy, like someone who's yes. Adam Thielen, reliable but like a zillion years old can't get actually open. Conkey's not only reliable but can get open. They that. That to me is they're they're going to address it in free agency probably or via trade somewhere along the line. They're like mm-hmm. I'm guessing like a T Higgins or a Michael Pittman will be a Panther next year, but that's not enough, right? You need a second yeah. guy, and so if you get a T Higgins, Lamb McConkey is the perfect number two for it. You got like T Higgins on one side, so I I think that thirty pick thirty three is going to be a wide receiver in this class, and it's going to be a much better wide receiver than what they got in the second round last year. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Uh, talk about a spark plug. I mean, my, my pro count for lad is Deontay Johnson right now. I think he's going to be one of the 10 mm-hmm. best route runners in the league. The day he gets drafted. It's, it's so fun to watch. Um, and I love that. I love that for Bryce. All right, Mike. Um, I am going to send you off on a little mini game here. Uh, the viewers may or may not know you went on the bachelor like six seven years ago was it six years ago it was like six yeah. almost six years ago to the date it's, it was like in early march of 2018 so yeah okay wow right before the draft huh it was they, they, that was made you made you sweat that out huh all right but um this free agency uh, i remember i remember asking one of the producers where josh josh Sitton signed and it was with <laughs> miami Oh, could you not have your phone? Because we couldn't have phones. So I couldn't follow oh, it. Oh, so. wow. Wow. Yeah. Um, cool. All right. All right. So we're, we're going to pretend you're going into the final round. You are the bachelor. Okay. And uh, we're going to make we're going to make you give a rose to I'm going to give you a quarterback and a wide receiver. And this doesn't this is not your highest ranked player. This is where your heart follows. Right. Mm-hmm. I'll let you interpret that as you will. So I'm going to do. Bo Nix, Michael Penix, and J.J. McCarthy. You have to give... Well, no, 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 no. I know you're giving it to Bo Nix. We can't put Bo Nix on there. <laughs> um, we'll just do Michael Penix and J.J. McCarthy. Ooh, this one's tough because I, I do think Michael Penix Jr. will be a starting quarterback in the NFL. I, I think there's like enough there that he can operate an NFL offense and not like have it be awful. Right. But whereas like, I feel more, I probably feel a little more comfortable, like saying that for sure he could be a starter. Whereas JJ, if you told me he just like flamed out entirely, I, I think I'd be, it wouldn't be, I'd be less surprised to be flamed out entirely than I would if Michael Penix Jr. did. But I also think McCarthy has kind of the higher potential at this point. You've seen six years now of Penix. I've only seen three of McCarthy and it's basically like, do you go with the 10? Do you go with the 10 that has baggage or do you go with the, (laughs) the, the seven or the eight that that with a great personality, you know? Yeah. With a great personality. (laughs) (laughs) But it's like, she could develop her personality, right? That's McCarthy. Right. You can work on it. He's still young. I will go. I'll go McCarthy though. Just because quarterback 20 to 32 doesn't win your Super Bowls, right? And that's why yeah. like, I still like him in the second or third if you're a team with a really good roster at the moment and maybe as like a backup situation to provide some insurance. Say you're, I don't know, even like someone like the Jets, if he's there in the third for you. I wouldn't mm-hmm. hate that because that's a guy who can probably play for you. Um, and with that defense, like could still win you games. But I just think McCarthy's chance at a high end. So in high end wins games in the NFL quarterback. So I'm going to go McCarthy. Yeah, Absolutely. Um, I think I, I probably would go the same route. I also just think Michael Penix's pocket presence is horrible and that scares the crap out of me. Um, 
All right, I'm going to give you three. He's odd, or he's just oddly bad off platform, like really bad off platform usually. Yeah. It seems like. That too. Um, okay, three wide receivers here. Xavier Leggett, Xavier Worthy, and Troy Franklin. Xavier Worthy. That one to me is not really – it's not really close. Uh, Xavier Leggett's okay. a, 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 just in third. Troy Franklin I think is a nice late second rounder vertical thread it just needs to get a lot stronger but like at this point can you back and guys get that much stronger so mm-hmm. worthy to me is like the cleanest role projection of those three that i like feel comfortable about him making an impact okay all right that was fun uh maybe we'll have you back and, and we'll you can give the final rose to get to your two yeah. picks there <laughs> all right everybody make sure you go check out mike's stuff uh thank you for being generous with your time renner uh Great to have you as always. And uh, thank you everybody for watching. We'll, We'll see you later. Peace out.